Amen. Thanks, guys. Hallelujah. Am I on here? Yeah. Amen. Hallelujah. We'll see if I am or not. <laughs> Glory to God. Well, the Lord is good. Can you say amen? amen? You know, Daniel and Heather Hindi, this project, of course, is because they're third year students at Rama in the missions uh, school. And uh, of course, they graduated from the first year and the second year. And then they came and worked for us for a number of years and they moved back to Rhema and they're in their third year. When I went to Rhema in 1978, that was the first year they had ever had a second year program. Sherry was there. First year they'd ever had a second year. I think we had like 800 and they had like 400. And the second year wasn't required in those days. Uh, but now Rhema has a third year and beyond. Really, I think you can get a whole college degree from through their different connections. But it's good to see you. I know it's spring break. I know we have people traveling and so forth, but we always have uh, have people coming in too. We have a lot of Sherry and Dean Jones family in this morning. Good to see Joe, David, and Holly from all the way from Tulsa. Glory, and good to see you all the way from Chattanooga. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Glory to God. But we're glad you're here. We're glad you're here. I know, like I said, I know people are still traveling. I, my daughter Heather called me this morning. They were in Valdosta, Georgia last night traveling home from their spring break. And uh, uh, she said, are y'all having service? And I said, oh yeah, the roads are totally clear here. I said, it's cold. But, uh, but the roads are clear. And, and if you're with us online, as always, we are so glad to have you. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Are you ready for the Word of God? Yes. Amen. How many of you are praying for Ukraine? Yes. Standing with the Ukraine. Praise God. Continue to do so. Continue to do so. Let's find two Bible openings this morning. We'll have it on the screen for you, one at a time, of course. But uh, you can find Psalms 27, excuse me, Psalms 20, verse 7. And then you can also go ahead and find Proverbs 21. So Psalm Chapter 20 will be there first, and then also Proverbs 21. Psalms 27 says, Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. And then Proverbs 21, verse 31 says, The horse is prepared for the battle, or for the day of battle, but deliverance is of the Lord. Amen. The horse is prepared for the day of battle, but deliverance is of the Lord. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of our Lord. David wrote to Psalm 20, you know, in his day, when you went to war, when you went to battle, having horses and chariots were a tremendous advantage. Amen. I mean, you can imagine trying to fight somebody there on horseback and you're not. You're, you're, you're a foot soldier and you're fight, trying to fight somebody on a chariot. So having, having these horses and chariots were a tremendous uh, advantage. But David said, my trust is not in these things. We have these things. We prepare, but my trust is not in these things. My trust is in the Lord. Can you say amen? See, we are, we in our battles and every spiritual battle that they fought in the Old Testament is just a type and shadow of the spiritual battles that you and I go through today. And in the battles and challenges and tests and trials of life that you and I face, we are not to just trust in the natural things available to us. No, we remember and trust in the Lord. So the horse is prepared for the day of battle, but deliverance, the Amplified Bible says, but deliverance and victory is of the Lord. Every somebody say, victory is of the Lord. Amen. Now there are things we can do in the natural. There are things that sometimes we should do in the natural, but our confidence and our faith is always in Almighty God. I'm talking about you have a spiritual battle that has to do with your family. You have a spiritual battle that has to do with your health. You have a spiritual battle that has to do with your mind or your emotions or with your children or with your job or with your relationships. Amen. We trust in the Lord. So we may use banks we may use doctors and we, and we may use our natural abilities and, and strength and so forth, but we should never make the mistake of not depending on God for victory and safety and deliverance. Can you say amen? amen. You know, the world doesn't know this. I think most Christians know this, but the world doesn't know this. As Christians, we know it's useless to fight against God. Amen. Amen. But sometimes we forget it's useless to fight without God. And anytime you try to do it in your own strength and in your own ability and, and you start worrying about it and stressing about it and just trying to do it in your own self, then, then you're doing it apart from God. And, and so, of course, it's useless to fight against God, but it's useless to fight without God. 
Amen. Amen. And you, how, how does somebody fight without God? Well, when somebody just ignores what his word says, they just, their heart's not really that much into this. They don't desire it very much and they just kind of ignore the things of God. Then they're fighting life's battles apart from God, without God. Amen. Sometimes people know what the word of God says, but they disagree with it. Yeah, we live in a day and age where a lot of people disagree with God. Sometimes people agree with God in certain areas of life, but then other areas of, of life, they just, they just disagree with God and they say, no, I'm not going, when it comes to my finances, I'm not going to do it that way. I'm, I mean, you know, I know what's best for me and my family and this is the way we're going to do it. Amen. That, that, that's not trusting in the Lord. That's just trusting in your own strength and ability. I mean, when it comes to my children, you know, I know what Dr. So-and-so says and I'm following this worldly advice and that worldly advice and I'm, I don't care what y'all say down there. I'm not going to follow the scriptures. Well, that, that's fighting without God. And it's even, it's even more serious and dangerous than that. You, you're in essence saying, I don't need God in this area of my life. I can handle it myself. I can do it on my own. And we don't ever want to be guilty of that. Amen? Amen. Glory to God. Amen. In other words, we should always in every situation be completely dependent on the Lord. Because in reality, we are dependent on the Lord. See, self-dependence and declaring independence from God is what messed this thing all up in the beginning to start with. Did you ever stop to think about it? It started with Satan saying, I will. You know, you can read that in Isaiah uh, 14. And he said, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of heaven. I will be like the most high God. I don't need God. I'll be my own God. I'll decide what's the right way to go. I'll decide what's the wrong way to go. And I'm going to do it my way. And I'm going to be my own God. And Satan's temptation to Adam and Eve in the garden, this is what this was all about. It was trying to get them to declare independence from God. In other words, if you'll, if you'll just eat of the tree of the fruit of good knowledge, then, you, then you'll become like God. That's what the devil said. You'll become like God. You can decide what's right for you. You can decide what's wrong for you. You can decide and distinguish between good and neat and, and evil. And anytime we do that, anytime we, we think that we can just do it on our own, anytime that, that, you know, I don't have any world views that don't come from Almighty God Himself. Amen. That's why I say jokingly sometimes, I don't care what you think about it, because I don't care what I think about it. I only care what God says about it. Amen. What God says about it, that's my opinion, that's my view. What God says about it, that's what's right. What God says about it, that's what's wrong. Yeah, but I think, no, 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 no. What God says, that's the right way to go. That's the best way to go. That's really the only way to go. And that's the way I'm going. Because I am totally dependent upon him. Whether you realize it or not, we're dependent on him for our next breath. We can't think apart from God, not think right, not think straight. Amen. And so, and so you know, uh, and, and so, you know, when the devil tried to become his own God. And when Adam and Eve declared in essence their independence from God and said, we'll decide, you know, for ourselves what's right and wrong and we'll be like God, it didn't work out too well for them, did it? Creflo Dollar said, the worst thing you can do is try to be like God without God. <laughs> to try to be like God without God. And the thing is, we may not consciously realize it as Christians, but what we're doing any time in life we're depending on self to get the job done. We're, declar we're declaring our independence from God. Anytime we do that. We may, we may just think, oh, this is a little thing, I can do it. No. And anytime we try to do anything apart from God, we stop the grace of God from working in our life. We stop the power of God, the wisdom of God, the ability of God flowing in our lives. So that's why it's always important that we, that we are completely and 100% dependent on God. When we, are de when we depend upon Him, we will make it. Amen. Everybody say, I'm going to make it. Amen. Now make it a faith statement. Say, I am making it. Amen. Amen. Why? Because you're depending on God. You're doing it his way. You're believing and trusting in him, not just in your own might and ability. So we must guard at all times, guard ever thinking we can handle something in ourselves. You know, depend on self and our past experiences and our wisdom you know, I got a couple coming in for marriage counseling and I've got, I've got 
you know, I've got folders on that. I just whip out that folder. And now listen, th those truths in that fo folder are based on the Word of God. That is dependent on God. But, but I can't just say, I can do this on my own. I know exactly what to tell them. I've done this 150 times. No, in every individual situation, I've got to say, God, I depend on you. I don't have any help for this couple. I don't have any wisdom apart from you. And I am depending on you to help me do this. Are you following me? And that's true in every area of life. Glory to God. And no matter, no matter what you do in life, big or little, rely on God and look to Him and ask Him for direction and wisdom. And never think, listen to me carefully here, never think you can successfully, victoriously, meaningfully accomplish or achieve anything unless you are completely dependent upon Almighty God. I want to say that again. Glory to God. Never think that you can successfully victoriously, meaningfully, meaningfully accomplish or achieve anything unless you are completely dependent upon God. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches, and apart from me, you can do nothing. Well, thank God we're not apart from him. Thank God we can abide in the vine. Glory to God. Amen. But we, we, what we need to realize is, is our total dependence upon him when it comes to our families, when it comes to child training, when it comes to finances, when it comes to health, and every other area of life. When Christians ignore God's word, they know what God's word says, but they ignore it, ignore it and don't do what it says. They're not dependent on God. Well, again, when Christians know what the word of God says, but they actually reject it and say, no, I'm not going to do it that way. That's declaring your independence from God. That's saying I'm my own God in this area and I'm going to do it my way. And when we fail to believe God's word, then we are not dependent on God. And, and, and just simply trying to handle things on our own. We, we, when we do that, we become disconnected from the, from the vine. We are a branch. You know, a disconnected branch can't produce anything. A disconnected branch is lifeless, is powerful, and it's unfruitful. I don't know about you, but I want to be fruitful and I want to be productive in any and everything that God has called me to do. I mean, yes, I enjoy his blessings and I preach that and teach that and I, I enjoy all those blessings. But more than anything, I want to be fruitful and productive in doing whatever it is that God's called me to do. Amen. Hallelujah. And, and, and this is one reason, not the only reason, but this is one reason that faith is so completely important. Real faith is complete dependence on God. Real faith is complete reliance and trust in God. You depend on God and, and it's so much, you simply rest in His Word, you rest in His wisdom, you rest in His ability, you know what His Word says, you believe it, and you rest in that. And there's nothing left to do but praise Him and thank Him that it's so. I'm just praising you and thanking you that it's so. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Can you say amen? amen. But anytime we just try to do it on our own or just forget to depend on Him, Amen. We get in trouble. I don't have any power on my own. I'm a branch. I don't have any wisdom on my own. I'm a branch. I don't, I'm not trying to do anything on my own. I'm a branch. Amen. I'm not relying on him for, for, for anything. Glory to God. I'm just relying on him, brother. I'm just relaxing and resting and relying on him and trusting in him and depending on him. The horse is prepared for battle. Amen. But I remember the Lord and I'm trusting in him. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And sometimes, let me put it this way. Have you ever went along for, for two months, three months, maybe five months and you were just hoping, you know, there's just a little, something's in your life and you're just kind of hoping that it would go away? Or you were just, you just, you just put up with it. Maybe you were worried about it and stressed about it. Or you're you just trying to fix it yourself. And then finally, finally, you know, I've done this. I'm just, just, just like you. And finally you say, what am I doing? And you turn to the Lord and you, and you pray about it. And you cast your care over the Lord. And then just in a matter of hours or just in a matter of a couple of days, that which you've been wrestling with for three or four months is just suddenly taken care of. I heard Brother Hagin say that recently on a tape. He said, you know, the way he put it, he said, I'm just as human as you are. He said, all of a sudden, you know, he, he said, I have some little pain in my shoulder. It's not a sickness. It's not a disease. It's, it's not a big, big deal. But he said, I don't know why. He said, but you just kind of put up with it. Just kind of go along for three or four months and put up with it. And then one day you stop and go, what am I doing? And you actually turn through the scriptures and look up your healing scriptures and release your faith. And then in a matter of an hour, it's all gone. Glory to God. 
I know this works because I lose a lot of things. <laughs> or I've lost things in the past. Uh, so I'm not going to say I lose a lot of things, but I have lost things at times. And I've tore the house down. I mean, mostly what I'm doing is trying to find some previous notes or some previous something that I really wanted. I mean, I'll look for it and look for it and look for it and look for it. And this may go on for two or three days. This may go on for two or three hours and then stop and go, Lord, you know where that's at. Help me find that. And within five minutes, find it. Within five minutes, find it. Can you say amen? Amen. 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 So don't try to handle things on your own. That's declaring your independence from God. And, and, and you know, God cares about every part of your life. I was, I was reading this old book, or reading in this old book by Oral Roberts, How to Live Above Your Problems. And he tells a little story here. Now, this probably goes back to the 60s. And, uh, you, you know, it's just interesting. He says, I was on a panel the other day after preaching a sermon. On that panel was a very highly educated man of God. Now, you've got to remember, Oral Roberts is internationally known. He's on TV shows. He's on late night talk shows. He's in all kind of forums. There's all kind of people there and, and the, the, you know, heads of denomination are on these panels and discussions and so forth. So he's on one of those panels. I respect him very much, but he and I were at opposite ends on the pole in the way we look at God. Here's what happened. During my sermon, I had said, if you were an Oral Roberts, if you, if you were on the Oral Roberts University campus, and it was examination time, you'd see the students going across the campus to the classroom. If you were close, you would see some of them with their heads kind of down, and they would be praying in the spirit. The reason they would be praying like this would be to quiet their nerves and calm themselves down. They believe the Holy Spirit can quicken their memory so they can make their grades. Not only do they study, but they also ask the Holy Spirit to give them some extra help. I thought it was a wonderful point. Then this fellow's time came. He got up and said, I want to tell you two things I don't like. First, a lay person, this was a meeting of pastors and laymen, rushed up to me this morning. She was excited and she said, I had a miracle this morning. I lost the buckle off my shoe and it worried me. I like that buckle. I began to hunt and couldn't find it. I asked the Lord to help me and I found my buckle and here it is. It's a miracle. He said, I don't believe in that kind of stuff. Second, he said, I admire Earl Roberts. He has so much influence across America. He really has influence over millions of people. He says his students go across the campus before they have their examinations and they pray so they will make better grades. I don't believe in that. I don't believe that God is concerned about trivial matters and inconsequential things. God is concerned about the world. He's concerned about pollution. He's concerned about civil rights. He's concerned about the big issues. He isn't concerned about whether you lose and find a buckle or whether you pass or fail an examination. One thing I don't like about Earl Roberts is he's always telling people that God is concerned about every little thing that per they personally face. The moderator of the panel turned and said, Dr. Roberts, please reply to this man. And he said, I didn't have any idea what I was going to say, but I just opened my mouth. He said, I said, well, when Jesus had to pay his taxes and didn't have the money, he sent one of his disciples, Peter, fishing. He pointed out when he would catch a fish and in that fish's mouth would be money. He told Peter to take that money and pay their taxes. If I didn't know that, and if I didn't know that Jesus said he counted the number of hairs on our head, then I might agree with the man that Jesus is not concerned with what he calls trivial matters. But there was nothing so small and personal that Jesus was not concerned about when he was on the earth. No matter how little it was, whether it was a pain in the body or a pain in the heart or something wrong in the country, he was concerned. I also believe that if this woman had lost a buckle and found it, and these students who pray before they have examinations can have faith for little things like this, then maybe when they face something bigger in life, such as cancer or a marriage problem, they can have faith for that. I had not known what I was going to say until I opened my mouth. When I finished, the audience stood up and cheered. But whether they cheered or not, I knew that I had told the truth. Amen. And I want to say it to you again, God is concerned about you. He is concerned about everything, big or small, that happens to you. So, you know, it's like, it's like this one guy that said, I want the Lord to help me with, with this, this, and this. And they said, well, what about those other things? He goes, oh, no, if he'll just handle half of them, I can handle the other half. <laughs> well, that might sound religious, but that's ridiculous. You need to let God handle all of it. Can you say Amen. I said, Amen. Now, turn to 2 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles chapter 15. 2 Chronicles chapter 15. Well, that's in the Old Testament. Well, duh. 
If you don't like the Old Testament, why don't you just not have one? Same God, same principles. Second Chronicles 15, we'll look at verse 17 in a minute, guys. David one time got in trouble for numbering the troops, for counting the troops. Makes perfect sense to me now, but when I first read the, the Bible back in the, you know, read it with excitement and hunger back in the 70s. Read it when I was a kid, but when I really read it. And I read through the New Testament 60 times, just a matter of two or three months, and read through the Old Testament, and now many times more since then. But when I first read this, I thought, well, why, why is it a big deal that you number your troops? But as you read the story, and you can look it up and read it, David got in a lot of trouble when he numbered the troops. Matter of fact, he sinned against God, and it cost him. It cost him some victories. When he faced Goliath, this is what David said. He said, the Lord does not save or deliver with sword or spear, for the battle is the Lord's. David went out and got five smooth stones. And he walked toward Goliath, probably slinging that sling, you know. But he said, I'm not trusting in my ability. I'm not trusting in my strength. I'm trusting in the Lord. It's the, it's the Lord that's going to give me victory over you, Goliath. It's the Lord that's going to give you victory over your battles. It's the Lord. And he said, I'm trusting in God, not my abilities. And God's people and for all time are told to trust in God and not rely on and not depend on their own efforts. And counting how many troops he had, David was testing the water, so to speak, to see, okay, how many we got? Because, you know, if you got, if you got 300,000, that's one thing. And, and the enemy you're fighting has 800,000. You only got 300,000. But if you got 600,000, ooh, a little better in it. How about if we got 800,000? How about if we got 1.2 million and they only have 700,000? Ah, surely I, we, we're a greater number. So that's what he was doing. He was counting the troops to see how strong his army was in the natural, according to their numbers. He was trusting in self. Amen. He said, I'm David. I've been in many battles. I, you know, I fought Goliath. I don't, you know, the whole deal. Trust in the Lord. All your heart. I did that. You know, didn't been there, done that. Got the t-shirt, kill Goliath. All that kind of stuff. He said, I, I, I can do this. You know, I got these mighty men. We, we'll go out there. We'll kick some, you know, Syrian tail. We, we can do this. We can do this. We're, we're, forgive me for saying tail in church. Tail, 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 tail. <laughs> he was seeing if he could win the battle on his own instead of depending on the Lord. And again, again, that's always, always a big mistake. Now, look at 2 Chronicles 15 17. It's talking about King Asa king of Judah, good king, but the high places were not removed from Israel. Nevertheless, the heart of Asa was perfect all of his days. The Bible says that the heart of King Asa was perfect. Didn't say Asa was perfect. Nobody has ever been perfect, not even a born again Christian, but, but you can have a perfect heart before the Lord. And then you hear that, I don't know that I've ever really, be honest with you, ever heard anybody totally satisfy me in their definition of what a perfect heart is. But I know it doesn't mean you're flawless. I know it doesn't mean you're perfect. You know, God wants, one of the songs we sing, God wants your heart. Amen? And a perfect heart is one that God has. God has your heart. You, you, you intend to do the right thing. You intend to follow God. See, He has your heart. You love Him. If God has your heart, you love Him. And out of that love, you do the right, doing the right thing doesn't mean you love God. No, 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 that's backwards. No, but, but because you love God, you want to obey Him. Because you love God, you want to follow Him. Because you love God, you want to do what He tells you to do. And when you, out of a heart of love, want to do what God tells you to do, then you are not perfect, you're not flawless, but you have a perfect heart. And the Bible says that Asa's heart was perfect before the Lord. Did you see that? Was his heart perfect before the Lord? It says all his days. Was his heart perfect before the Lord all his days? Are, are you convinced? What the Bible says. All right. 
Then when you go on to chapter 16, I'm not going to take the time to do it, but I want you later on, here's some homework, read chapter 16 verses 1 through 6. You'll find out that what happens is an enemy king, actually the king of Israel because it's a divided kingdom, comes out against King Asa. So King Asa, although he has fought and won many battles just like David did, the battle is the Lord's, but he forgot, see, see, some trust in chariots and some trust in horses, but we will remember the Lord our God. But in this case, he forgot to remember the Lord his God. Doesn't mean he doesn't have a perfect heart, but in this case, he forgot to remember the Lord his God. And what he did is he went out and got the Syrians. He paid them. He actually took, you know, some of the, some of the uh, treasures that were in the temple of God, you know, he took those treasures out and used that money to hire, you know, we hear a lot about conscripting soldiers with Russia, Ukraine right now. He conscripted Syria to come. They didn't do it because they loved Israel. They just did it for the money. To come and help fight with him against his enemy. So he said, this is, this is a smart thing to do. This is a wise thing to do. We can handle this. You know, our army is only 500,000, but theirs is 500,000. We put these armies two together. We're going to have a million man army. And so you just come on, big boy. We'll handle you. We'll defeat you. And as far as he was concerned, it all worked out pretty good. Except for the rest of his life, he had battles with Syria, who was his enemy. And as we read on, we're going to find out God said, if you had trusted me and relied on me, I would have given you victory over your enemy and Syria would not have been a thorn in your side. You would have defeated them and not had war after war after war and year after year after year with them. We know how horrible war is right now. Right, we see it on live TV almost with Russia in its unprovoked, unnecessary attack on Ukraine. And so, but can, can you imagine if, if, you, if you deal with this for two or three years or maybe you deal with this for the next 13 years and then you don't deal with it for two years and then you deal with it for another five years and then you, you know, and it's just, or, or, or it's over and done with and you defeated them and they never bother you again. That'd be much better, wouldn't it? So when he did it his way, he got a little success in the natural, but if he'd have done it God's way, it would have been wonderful. So in verse number seven, we read, at that time, Hananiah the seer came to Asa, king of Judah, and said to him, because you have relied on, about half the new modern translations say, because you have depended on, depended on, because you have relied on the king of Syria and not relied on, not trusted in, not depended on the Lord your God. Therefore, the army of the king of Syria has escaped from your hand. And then the bottom of verse number 9 says, In this you have done foolishly, therefore from now on you shall have wars. So he could, have, he could have defeated his enemy, defeated Syria, and been through with them, and never had any more wars with them had he relied on and trusted in God. So You know, the Bible is, is we, we talk a lot about God gave, God gave, God gave, God gave, God gave, and certainly he did. But the Bible, from our perspective, is really about will you receive what God gave? Will you receive? If you don't receive, it doesn't matter how much God gives. If you don't receive it, it never becomes yours. Wisdom is available. Strength is available. Finances are available. Help is available. Deliverance is available. Victory is available. But you have to receive it. And if you don't receive it, it never becomes yours. To as many as received him, he gave the power. See? So you have to receive what God gives. And that's where the church world is missing. They, they, they think, well, I don't have these things. Well, you have to receive them. And, and, and by relying on God and trusting in God, that King Asa could have received total and complete victory, not a little partial victory. Cost him a lot, cost him a lot. And so it says, in that time, Hananiah the seer came to Asa, verse 7, because you have relied on, depending on the king of Syria, and not relied on the Lord your God, therefore the army of the king of Syria has escaped from your hand. Verse number 8, were the Ethiopians and Lubim not a huge army with very many chariots and horsemen? In other words, they had a lot of natural strength. They had a lot of natural ability. And they were a very huge army. How big was the army? Somebody say, how big was the army, Pastor Mark? I'm glad you asked. You can look back just a couple of chapters. Verse number 14, 2 Chronicles 14, verse number 9. The Ethiopian came out against them with an army of a million men and 300 chariots. A million man army. A million man army. 99% of the countries in the world today don't have a million man army. Verse number, where is that? Where is that? 
Glory to God. Verse number 11 says, And Asa cried out to the Lord. Watch what Asa did this time. He cried out to the Lord. Lord, it is nothing for you to help, whether with many or with those who have no power. Help us, O Lord our God, for we rest on you. We depend on you. We look to you. And in your name we go against this multitude, O Lord. You are our God. Do not let man prevail against you. Amen. Verse 12. So the Lord struck the Ethiopians before Asa and Judah, and the Ethiopians fled. And then as you read down, the bottom of verse 13 says, And they carried away very much spoil, and they went on to, to uh, verse 14. They got exceedingly much spoil in all these cities and all these different places that they overcame, and they defeated them totally and thoroughly because they relied and trusted on God. That's better. That's better. You can try to handle your finances yourself and get a little success, but I promise you, if you do it God's way, it'll be better. It'll be better, 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 better. Yeah. Glory to God. Or anything else in life. Now watch this, watch this. Verse number, verse number nine, very famous scripture. Amen. Well, let me read the rest of verse eight again. Were the Ethiopians and the Lubin not a huge army with very many chariots and horsemen? Yet... Because you relied on the Lord, because you depended on Him, He delivered them into your hand. We just read that. Verse 9. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show Himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is perfect toward Him, is right toward Him. And this you have done foolishly. Therefore, from now on, you shall have wars. Amen. God's not saying I'm punishing you and giving you these words. You're just going to have them because you didn't do it my way and defeat the enemy. Glory to God. Oh, hallelujah. Listen to this. I've read this for years. I'm going, well, his, his heart is strong on behalf of those whose heart is perfect toward him. But then I read one day and it hit me. Asa's heart was perfect before the Lord. God's not telling Asa, you didn't have a perfect heart with me. He's going, look, man. Your heart was right. You know, your heart does need to be right with God to enjoy the blessings of God and, and to walk with God and live for God. You know, you need to live for God. You need to walk in the light. If you sin, you repent and ask God to forgive you. He's saying, look, your, your heart was right with me. I'm looking for people whose heart is right with me. All you had to do was recognize like you did before that the battle is not yours, but mine. All you had to do was depend on me and trust in me instead of trying to work it out in your own power and your own ability and your own strength. And I would have rescued you. I would have delivered you. I would have given you complete victory. Oh, glory to God. Did you see that? Hey, your heart was right. I was willing. I was ready to help you. God is willing and ready to help you. All you need to do is look to him and trust in him and depend on him. Listen, if you'll just, just have a right heart toward God. Some people don't have a right toward God, but, but you can take care of that in a matter of seconds. But if your heart is right toward God, if he has your heart, you intend to do the right thing. You're walking in the light. Then depend on him. If you depend on him, you'll make it. I promise you, you'll make it. I don't care what comes your way. You'll make it. You'll be victorious. You'll have the kind of marriage you should have. You'll have the kind of home you should have. You'll, you'll be blessed in your finances. You'll be blessed in your health. You'll be blessed in your job. You'll be blessed in your relationships. Oh yeah, you'll have some tests and trials and, and these things won't necessarily happen overnight, but you'll have to just hang in there and be faithful and do what God says and everything's going to be all right and turn out all right. God will fight your battles and you can just sit back and rest in him knowing that the battle is the Lord's. So don't ever declare your independence from God, for instance, concerning your marriage. Well, you know, bless God, I know enough scriptures to know she's going to do what I tell her to do. Yeah, you don't know squat. You're so stupid, you ought to stay in the house. And it's probably dangerous in there for you. Find out what God says. Do it God's way. Don't just depend on your own efforts to make it good. Well, I'm just going to be a nice guy. Listen, there are people in the world that do that. They're not even saved. If you do that, you may end up divorced. And they say, well, you, and you may be 100 miles away from divorce, but it won't be as good as it could be. It won't be as good as it should be. It won't be as good as it needs to be. And that's true. That's true. Listen to me. That's true. That's, that's true about your job, about your finances, about your children, about your mental health, about your physical health, about your relationships, and everything else in life. 
Do what God says about these things and you'll get so, so much more out of it and you won't end up defeated and you'll be abundantly, abundantly blessed. Can you say amen? amen. The battle is always the Lord when, everybody say when. when. When we with a perfect heart rely on and depend on him in faith. That's what it boils down to. I said, the battle is always the Lord. And if the battle is the Lord's, then you're going to come out on top. You're going to be okay. You're going to be more than okay. You're going to be more than all right. And the battle will always be the Lord's when you, with a perfect heart, rely on and depend on God in faith. Then you'll be rescued. Then you'll be helped. Then you'll be blessed. Then you'll be protected. Can you say amen? When we rely on and depend on him, meaning we do things his way. If you know what his way is and you say, I'm not going to do it that way for whatever the reason, because you don't believe that's the right way, because you just don't want to, because you've been influenced by some worldly philosophy, for whatever the reason, whatever the reason, whatever the reason, when you, when you, when you, when you, when you don't do things his way, amen, then things will not work out like they should. So when we, when we rely on him and depend on him and do things his way and trust his way, then, we will, then he will always show himself strong in our behalf. Amen. Say, say, why don't you say that out loud? For the eyes of the Lord, the of the Lord are looking for me because I have a perfect heart to show himself strong in my behalf. I believe that, don't you? Yes. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And that means you'll receive all that he has for you and you'll make it in grand, grand style. Oh, glory to God. Can you say amen? amen. Let's stand up. Let's stand up. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're, you're a branch. Thank God we're branches connected to the vine. That's why, you know, because if you abide in me, that means if you, if you walk in fellowship with me and, and pray and spend time with me and worship me, you know, you, you'll, 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 you'll get all the stuff you need that the vine gives you. I heard Pat Robertson say many, many years ago, he said, you know, when I was growing up, we had, I think he said, apple orchard in his backyard. And he said, you could get up in the middle of the night and you could sneak out there. And I never once saw one of them apple trees straining to try to produce apples. Those branches just rested in the, in the vine. Mm -hmm. and they got everything it needed from the vine. Everything you ever needed. Everything you ever wanted. Beyond your wildest imaginations. And to me, first and foremost, that's being productive in his kingdom and serving him and doing his will is available through Jesus Christ, the vine. Amen. But not if you try to do it on your own. First funeral I ever did was somebody from Chattanooga. I was in Cleveland in those days. The pastor in Chattanooga was not available to do it. And so the pastor that I worked for, you know, they knew, you know, the same kind of church, Word of Faith Church. So they wanted him to do the funeral. And he was not available. And so I'm third choice. Uh, the lady had committed suicide, and I'm third choice. I went to the funeral, and it's probably to this day, maybe, except for somebody like Brother Higgins, you know, but, but maybe, the, I think it's probably the biggest funeral I have ever been to in my life. Person committed suicide, and I'm third choice. People at the casket are falling on the ground. I'm talking, picking them up, dress flying over their head, you know, Terrible, terrible scene. I was extremely aware of my dependence upon the Lord our God. <laughs> extremely aware. Before I ever got there. When I got there, shocked by the size of the crowd, shocked by the whatever. And I began to open my mouth and speak as the Lord to help me and gave me utterance. And by the end of that, that service, people in the audience, all over the audience were smiling. The Spirit of God fell on that place. And it was a powerful, powerful service. Now, you know, over the years, I've done a lot of funerals. You know, like the, the old cowboy, Monty Welch. Anybody know what that is? There's an old version, a new version. Well, Monty Welch was the ultimate cowboy, and it's about the cowboy life and everything. And, and in one scene in the movie, they go, they go ain't, nobody can cowboy. Monty, ain't nobody can cowboy like Monty. 
sometimes like my, my daughter, she even said to me when she said, she said, ain't, ain't nobody funeral like daddy. <laughs> Done a lot of funerals. Had, had funeral directors come up to me who do this. They love people. They care about people. Many times they're former ministers. But I've had them come up to me afterwards and say, I never heard anything like that in my life. But I've also done a couple, it wasn't bad by any stretch of the imagination, but I realized afterwards that I had done so many and been praised so many times about what a good job you do at funerals that I just kind of depended on my past experiences at doing the funeral instead of really depending on God. And it wasn't what it could have been. It wasn't what it should have been. Don't ever depend on self. I said, don't ever depend on self. Ever. We may not realize it, but when we do, we're saying, we're declaring our independence from God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I tell the story sometimes because it, it's true. We, you know, we have Christian school here and we, we, we at our Christian school, we have chapel speakers come in Sometimes we have a lot of outside chapel speakers. Sometimes just just once every five or six weeks or whatever. But it was it was we were their other building, the old building had a school of about 150 kids in those days. And uh, one of the older students said, "Who are we having for chapel today?" And somebody else said, "I think Pastor Mark's doing it." And of course they didn't see me. I was over to the side. And this other girl went, "Oh God, why can't we ever have somebody good?" <laughs> So I slinked down and went back to my office. <laughs> and I said, oh God, <laughs> you're going to have to help me today. <laughs> They're not all out there smiling. I mean, you can say something. I mean, I guarantee you, our Christian school today, I can tell them that same thing. You all laugh. They'd all sit there and go, huh. <laughs> but again, I was extremely aware of my dependence upon the Lord. And long story short, I cried out for the battle to be his. And I, I trusted in him, not in how many chariots I had. <laughs> and I went out there and, and the, the Holy Ghost fell on the service and it was powerful. You get it, don't you? Yes. Say, Lord, I acknowledge. Lord, I, acknowledge. I, am totally on you. I am totally dependent on you. Your ways are always right. Your ways are always right. I'm, the I'm the branch. Everything I need, Everything I need. comes from you. I will do my part, but I acknowledge the battle is yours. Deliverance comes from you. So every battle I face, every challenge I face, I rely on you. I trust in you for the battle is the Lord's and the victory is mine as I depend on you. Well, praise him about that a little bit. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. I'll go back to what Creflo Dollars, and I liked it so much. I was at Brother Copeland's minister's conference just, you know, a month or two ago, and he said, the worst thing you can do is try to be like God without God. <laughs> That's good, isn't it? Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you're saved, then you know it. Lift both hands to heaven. Glory to God. I'm looking. I know you all are. If you're filled with the Holy Ghost, lift both hands. Hallelujah. We need to get some uns in here. <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Any of you prophets got anything up here you want to say? Huh? Well, I'm through. Glory to God. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, you're going to do something else. I got it. I'm not stupid. <laughs> this could be prophetic. <laughs> you don't know that. Why don't y'all be seated for just a second, please? I have the privilege today of the acknowledgement of someone we love dearly. It's birthday. I'm not going to say who it is. Pastor Mark. Uh, but Doug, Doug Clark normally does this. He couldn't be here today. He's out of town. So I am, as you said a while ago, you were third choice. I'm second choice. Uh, <laughs> but no, uh, 
I, I, you know, I want to say something, and then we're going to do three things. But uh, I'm, I'm so thankful that Pastor Mark is my pastor here. I really am. I, you know, uh, I first met Pastor Mark in 1992. That's 30 years ago. Man, that's, that's a long time. You know, and, and uh, before that, I used to, we used to get the uh, paper every Sunday, and I would, I would look in it. And back then, um, the church would put, would put a picture in the paper, Pastor Mark, Miss Margaret, and, and, and a little picture, and it would say, come join pastors Mark and Margaret Strickland, you know. Uh, and I, I always looked at and I was going to a Baptist church back then. And uh, I would always see that, and something, something would, would look like, it's just like jump inside of me. It's just like I would get excited when I'd see that picture, and I thought, I wonder what that is. Well, I had no idea. Nobody had taught me about the Holy Spirit then. I didn't know what that was. But it was the Holy Spirit, and it was trying to acknowledge, you know, that, hey, you need to be there. Uh, and I thought, that's so sweet. You know, when I'd see that little picture, I thought, this church has put a picture of their pastor and his daughter in the paper. And, <laughs> and I, I thought, I wonder what happened to the wife, you know. And <laughs> I throw that in there for you, Miss Margaret. But uh, <laughs> and then we came here, and I realized that wasn't his daughter, you know. But... Uh, yeah, I, I just can't express enough how much the teachings of, 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 of God through this man has blessed my life. And I know it has blessed all, all of y'all too. Um, you know, in Exodus chapter 3, we've got the story of Moses, God calling Moses to do a work, to deliver his, the children of Israel out of Egypt. And, and, and five times, you know, Moses argued with God like, I can't do that. I can't speak. I can't do this. I can't do that. And then finally, you know, in the fifth time, it says the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. And Moses is like, oh, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. Pastor Mark, I'm just going to say this. I am so glad that you accepted that call to step out and be our pastor here. And uh, there's, there's, as you said a while ago, Oral Roberts touched millions of people live. You, there's no telling how many countless thousands and thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people you've touched, possibly millions in your ministry. And, and, and we're just thankful for that. We're thankful to have you as our pastor. Does anybody here want to share a brief testimony about something that Pastor Mark has done for them, their life? Not all at once, John. <laughs> Linda Ray, I know you always got something to say. <laughs> well, I, come up here. Come up here just a minute. Come here. Come here. I know you got to say something good. Well, I wasn't prepared to say I know you wasn't prepared to say This is spontaneous. That, see? that I love you. <laughs> you know, I do. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to mess this up for you. <laughs> Uh, but, but you know, he. when Kenny and I first came to this church, it was back in 1998, and the Lord brought us here, uh, of course, and we didn't even, we had just got born again. We were in our late 20s, but we, we had always thought we'd been Christians, but somebody asked me one time, well, do you have a personal life with Christ? And I thought, well, I'm sure I do, you know, <laughs> but I realized I didn't. I didn't talk to him. I only prayed when something got hard in life. And so I started praying and, and, and I had fasted and I said, Lord, you lead me to the right church, one that I will not be deceived in any way. Well, he brought us here. Kenny and I didn't even know how to pronounce a lot of the books of the Bible. I remember, uh, you might've heard me say this one time, um, he said, turn to Hosea. Um, yeah, it is Hosea. And, and we thought it was Hosea, you know, because <laughs> it, it was spelled that way. And Kenny and I looked at each other and said, my gosh, that's what it's called. You know? <laughs> and, and, and then anyway, Pastor has blessed us personally. Uh, he's come to our house, laid hands on us. He's, he's, he's in, 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 in Margaret too, you know. So, 
I wasn't prepared to just come up with a story, but he has blessed us, he and Margaret, and their children. We love their whole family. They have blessed us along the way, and we have grown and grown uh, in, in spirit and in might through listening to um, the words that God would give him because he would be anointed up there, and that's what we need. We don't need somebody up there giving us all their ideas. We need a pastor that's anointed in the pulpit that, that gets God's word across. And I'm thankful that you're that kind of pastor. Amen. Amen. Good word. See, that's, that's, that's so anointed. Thank you, Linda. Now, Pastor, we're going to do three things. Now, we can go on here until about 1 o'clock, but we wouldn't be able to get to the Mexican restaurant in time to eat before the crowd. You know, when we went to the Baptist church, we always used to go and we'd get to the fried chicken, but us charismatics, we eat that Mexican all the time. That's smart. And I know that's important, so... But when he said, does anybody have anybody to say, you know, this just came up in my heart, and I just wanted to uh, say this. I'm holding on to you, Tommy. <laughs> um, you know, Mark is my husband, and that's a relationship, of course. But he's also my pastor. And I don't know if I've ever said this in front of everybody. I've said it to Mark. But, you know, um, you know people want to, um, you know, give me words of appreciation or... or or praise sometimes or whatever, but, you know, I just want to publicly say that he's been my pastor all of my um, adult life, practically, and the reason that any, the good things, anything, <laughs> the person that I am today greatly and largely goes back to the fact that Mark has been my pastor, and he's taught me also, things from the Word of God that I've been able to stand on and it's made the difference in my life that I can have a life of victory. And most importantly, he emphasizes and teaches on the love of God. And, you know, as a younger person and growing up and before we were living for the Lord, you know, I I was one of those really moody people, you know, looking back. You know, I could be moody. I could be laughing. Then. <laughs> I can imagine. Glory to God. And, you know, I could be depressed and, you know, feel sorry for myself and be uh, melancholy. It's probably a good word, you know. But because... Mark has been so faithful and consistent to teach on the love of God and to teach about the power of forgiveness and not being resentful or bitter or hurt, you know, not allowing yourself to hold on to hurts or whether real or imagined, and a lot of those are imagined. I've been able to grow consistently in the Lord to a person that wants more than anything to walk in the love of God. And I have some scriptures written down all through the Bible where Paul or someone talked about someone and it said they were a refreshing to us. And that's become my goal in life, to be a person of love and to be a refreshing to my husband and to everyone I know, to all of you. And I'm thankful that you have consistently taught on love and forgiveness and faith and victory and that I'm blessed to have benefited from you as my pastor also. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Margaret. Thank you. Good word. I, I, I can't say anything to top that. I will say one more thing. This man, if I can sum it up, I mean, great Bible teacher, friend, man with a spirit of excellence about him. 
And I mean that. I don't, I don't say that lightly. I mean that. I mean, you know, as I was praying about what to say today, and uh, I'm like, the spirit of excellence, that's you, Pastor Mark. I mean, you can look at everything in your life. I mean, you can, you can look, at, look at your office, look at your, look at this church and the grounds outside, your house, your car. My God, you ever rode in this truck? I mean, you're afraid to touch anything. You know, it's just like, it's just like perfect. It's brand new. You know, the man I know drives a black truck and it's flawless all the time, all the time. <laughs> yeah, boat, yeah. And uh, I, I just sums it up. You're a man with a spirit of excellence, and we appreciate that about you, Pastor Mark. I could, I could sit here until, like I said, 1, 2 o'clock talking about things, but uh, we got three things we're going to do right quick. One, we're going to pray for you. And two, we're going to sing happy birthday to you. I don't know any vocalists in here uh, that might want to lead that. Dean. You're the man, yes, yes. And then after we, after we sing happy birthday to you, we're going to line up in a very orderly fashion, and we're going to come around through here this way. Pastor Mark's going to stand here. We're going to have a, a, um, a bag right here, a happy birthday bag. If you brought a card or anything to acknowledge him, you can just put it in the bag. Uh, money, drop money in. Money is appreciated. You know, car keys, anything like that. Uh, put it in the bag. Come by and please say hi to him, and and just tell him you love him. You know, don't 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 be like some sneak out the back door. Oh God, I didn't bring a card today. You know, uh, just please come by and, and tell him you love him, you appreciate him. But Pastor Mark, come up here, man. We're gonna pray for you right quick. I just feel impressed to do that, and. Uh, I just thank you. Father, I just, y'all, y'all stretch your faith, your hands to this way towards Pastor Mark and, and, and join in with me. Father, we thank you today. We thank you for our pastor, Pastor Mark Strickland, today, Lord, that he celebrates another birthday today, another day of life and life more abundantly. Father, we ask that you fill him with wisdom, Father God, wisdom from on high in, in how to, and how to continue to, to, to be the pastor of this church, the uh, leader in his house, and, and the leader amongst all of us, the sheep, Father God, that are, that are fed daily and weekly uh, by his word, Father God, from you. Lord, we just thank you for this. We thank you, Father God, that you bless him today and throughout this year as he celebrates uh, another birthday. And, and Father, we just love him. We appreciate him, and we thank you so much for him in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hey, you're welcome. You're welcome. How about a birthday? Birthday to you. If you'll put that bag up, y'all welcome to just come down and tell him you love him, speak to him. Miss Margaret, you gonna go up there with him? No? <laughs> I'm done. Y'all go ahead. <laughs> 